last week we kind of closed out the service um, giving an assignment. Because Sarah was sharing on the that thought of overcoming and bitterness and uh, God wants to give deliverance and you know, but somehow sometimes bitterness wants to stay with us and we have to meet with God in order to be set free uh, from that. And so the assignment was, you know, look to the Lord and inquire of Him and and just say, Lord, is there something in my life that needs to be cleansed? Is there something to, you know, an area of deliverance, a further area that you, of deliverance you want to bring? And um, now I gave that assignment for a, a specific reason and that's uh, because one morning I was praying and I, I felt the Lord speak uh, to me about uh, our church. And I felt him say that there are those in this church or perhaps watching online that had experienced difficulties in the past. And, you know, maybe past hurts or unkindness or bitterness, uh, offenses. And it was like being bitten by a lion or a bear. And, and you know, when you're bitten like that, that hurt can stay there. It can stay with you. And, and, it, and because it's unhealed, it's like an enemy is, is able to latch on because of that. And you know, of course, for me as a pastor, that's a concern to, to hear about the lion and the bear coming around because I want I wanna deal with those things and deliver the sheep. Uh, but I've also been just kind of considering this and meditating on the Lord and because I also believe it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that's ordained by the, God, by the Lord as a time of deliverance, as a time of victory, because God has come to set his people free. And I, the verse I got was Psalm 58 and verse 6. And it says, Break their teeth, O Lord, in their mouth, break the te- break the great teeth of the young lions, O Lord. Let them melt away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bows to shoot his arrows, let them be cut in pieces. You know, break the teeth of the lion. And of course, Satan isn't. He's the roaring lion, isn't he? And he he goes around trying to bite people and infect them with what he was infected with, which was deep unforgiveness, right? That's what he has against God because he lost his exalted position in heaven through disobedience and rebellion. And so he would love nothing better than to see God's people infected with what he has been infected with, right? Those same bitter feelings. And, And so he keeps roaring and rumbling and speaking and whispering and all those things that you know, he does to so that we don't forget our our past, you know, past things that that want to keep rising up. Um, and and it's like through that remembrance, he still has a hold. Right? We keep feeling that bite and it's almost like the wound is never allowed to heal because it just keeps coming back. And, you know, of course, in the natural, uh, a wound that that doesn't heal can get infected. Right. But in the spiritual you know, you can also have spiritual wounds that can cause all sorts of trouble because it can open the door to different things. You know, we can see this in uh, part in, in the story of the Corinthian church. You know, Paul gave them a warning and, you know, because they had a, you know, of course, we talked about this in, in our study on repentance. They had a man in their midst who was in deep sin you know, and it was in the sight of everyone in the congregation. Um, and they had to break fellowship with them because of that sin. And, uh, of course, they had to receive the admonishment of the Apostle Paul. But the wonderful thing is, is what when they obeyed, when they followed what Paul said, um, you know, well, they had first, they had a re- horrible realization of what they had done and allowing that, that sin to continue uh, with that with that man remaining. But the thing is, is that man repented. And, and because they broke fellowship with him, it caused him to realize the gravity of his sin. And he turned from that sin. He turned to the Lord. He repented. And so now he's still separated from the church. And so what does Paul do? He's, he's encouraging them, forgive. 
You know, let the forgiveness of God now work so that he can come back. And But when Paul is saying this, he says something very interesting. It's, it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. And this is very instructive for us. We want to pay attention to this. 2 Corinthians 2.10 says, To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything, to whom I forgive it, and for your sakes, forgive it I in the person of Christ. Verse 11, lest Satan get an advantage of, of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You see, we have to be very aware of the need to forgive and be cleansed from areas of the past. Because if we don't, something very significant takes place. You know, of course, unforgiveness is one of the devices of Satan. And Paul says, we are not ignorant of how Satan wants to come into the church, how he wants to come into the, to the people of God and cause trouble and disrupt and, and cause discord. A big area that he comes in is unforgiveness. But yet, in one sense, it's a, it, when we let those things stay, we're giving Satan an advantage. You know, to be able to continually come back and bring the memory of that, the, the, the thoughts, the feelings, the hurts, the pain, and so forth. You know, in the natural, you think of that word advantage. Um, you know, maybe, maybe some of you played sports or you knew people who played sports and you went to games. But, you know, think about if, how, what a terrible thing to realize if you were on a, on a sports team and you're competing, or maybe you're competing against someone and they have a big advantage over you. You know, it, it, you know maybe if you're going to wrestle someone and you just look up like, wow, they're like two feet taller than me. And they got 70 pounds on me. Um, you, that, in one sense, it's almost like you've kind of lost before you start because you realize their advantage is so great. And you're starting from a disadvantage. It kind of makes you feel defeated almost before you compete. But yet, in the spiritual realm, when we open the door, if there is an open door, that's what it, it can feel like when we're trying to overcome. And there's that specific reason why Satan can get an advantage over some uh, in this area. And that is because of this. Because unforgiveness breeds hardness of heart. Unforgiveness breeds hardness of heart. We talked about this a little bit in our study on true Christianity last Thursday, I believe. And we were looking at what is true long suffering, right? The apostle Paul knew what long suffering was. He had to suffer long because he caused a lot of suffering too. But, and so the Lord ordained him to be the, the apostle of long suffering and demonstrate that. So he could preach on that with some authority, but really long suffering involves dealing with uh, difficult people for a long time. And, you know, when you're dealing with difficult people, maybe people who aren't nice or they say things that are hurtful or do things. I mean, in Paul's, you know, Paul's situation, they didn't just say things, they did things. They laid many stripes on him. And, you know, I'm sure they said some not nice things too. Well, we got some of that in the scripture, but he went through a lot of things. But, you know, when you're dealing with someone who's attacking or not nice or causing hurt or so forth, or maybe you have things in the past, there's only two things. There's only two responses you can give to try and deal with the pain of that. Well, the first thing is obviously you cry out to God, you know, Lord, Lord, I need to meet with you. Lord, cleanse me. Give me your divine empowerment to overcome in this situation and, and to continue to keep my eyes on you. Right? To meet God in the situation. That's the, that's the first option. Well, the other option is what we talked about of a false long suffering. Because the only other option is to harden your heart, is to harden yourself, right? Otherwise, you're just constantly feeling that pain and that, that sorrow of that. And so naturally, we harden ourselves to it. Well, I'm not going to think about that anymore, right? I'm just going to cut that person off or not even think about that. You know, 
we can harden ourselves to those bitter feelings or memories or people. Now, the problem with a hard heart is it also cuts us off from the life of the Spirit. It disconnects us. And we, we might not see it at first, right? In the beginning, it actually might bring some relief, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I don't have to think about that person to put it, put it kindly anymore or deal with that. I'm not even going to think about it or I'm not even going to talk to them anymore. Cut them off. But eventually there will be a difference because there is always an effect in our relationship with God when our heart becomes hard, even in, a, in an area. Now, one of the things we see in Scripture is that our connection with God in heaven is dependent upon our connection with other people on earth. That's something to consider. It's something very important, right? How we connect with God is dependent upon our human connections with other people on, on earth. And now I'm sure we all desire to have a an increased connection with God and with heaven, right? right? We want that to grow. We want to hear from God and, and to ha- receive life and so forth, especially when it comes to our prayer life, right? None of us like to pray and feel nothing, right? To feel no connection or maybe less of a connection than we did last week. It's like, well, Lord, what happened? What did I do wrong? Right? We want that connection to be alive. Well, you know, Jesus spoke about that connection that we can have in, with him in prayer. You know, one of, the, one of the most encouraging verses about prayer, Mark eleven twenty four, 24, where Jesus said this. He said, therefore, I say unto you, what, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you'll receive them and you shall have them. That's our goal. Right, to have a connection to heaven where we lift our eyes to the Lord and we pray, we talk to him, we commune, we receive answers to our questions. Right, When we lift up our needs and cry out that the Lord would hear us um, and we receive life from him, Jesus says, pray and believe and you'll have them. Right, What a beautiful promise of a living connection with our God in heaven. But let's also look at the next verse he shares directly after that. It doesn't include the word but, (laughs) but yet there's a connection. He shares about something that can get in the way of this taking place. Verse 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, that, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses, But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And so here's that human connection. Right? If we want to have a connection with God in heaven, then our connection with others on earth must be right, must be clear and clean, cleansed. And so in this situation, we're going to look at, at, at another one here in a moment. But in this situation, if you have anything against another... Right? And maybe you have a good, very good and legitimate reason for having it against another. The Lord doesn't get into that. He just says, if you have anything and you want to have a connection with me, forgive. Let that be cleansed. Let me wash it away. You know, to ensure that, that there's no blockage to the flow of life. You know, in one sense, that's our obligation. That's our responsibility before God. So that we can have that flow from him. And we're not holding on to something else in our hearts. You know, the horrible outcome of unforgiveness, of course, is that the father will not forgive, uh, which is kind of unthinkable in reality, because that is eternally devastating, right? Not to be forgiven. And so there's a situation where we have something against another, but then there's another occasion where Jesus talks about kind of a, the opposite situation, um, the other side of the equation of our human relations. This is in Matthew 5 and verse 23. And it says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you. 
leave your gift and go and first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Now here's the other side of the coin or the equation you could say, you know, if your brother has something against you, leave your gift. Now that's quite remarkable also because, you know, here you are, you're coming into the presence of God, you're coming uh, to worship, to offer the sacrifice of praise, and God says, well, before you give that to me, before I, I'm gonna accept that, you need to fix your relationship with this person. And in this case, it's, it's not what someone's done to you, it's what you've done to someone else. And so God is concerned with both aspects of our relationships. You know, we need to, you know, we meet God, that we meet God in how we have been treated, but also in how we treat other people. And that to me is scary, right? I'm going to meet God, not based upon how much I know, you know, or how, uh, what, you know, my gifts or anything or my calling. I'm going to meet him based on how well I treat other people. If I've shown love to them, if I've shown his qualities, his goodness, his kindness, his patience, and so forth. That's how God describes our relationship with him. And some of the things that can get in the way of that, Lord, help us. <laughs> help us to be like you, because the more we become like him and show that to other people, the stronger our connection is with heaven. Now, Peter brings, brings this out in his letter. And of course, we're, we're in the context of, of our prayer life, of having a relationship with, with the Lord in prayer. And, and, and actually, Peter mentions it three times in his letter. He talks, uses the word prayer and the concept of praying. And I was very kind of surprised in considering these because each time he re references praying, there's a direct implication on how our prayer can either be empowered or hindered by our conduct. You know, it, there's something interesting when you, when you notice in the scriptures, especially in the New Testament and the Psalms, that receiving answers and growing in our, in our prayer life, um, you know, it has less to do with the amount of time we pray uh, and more to do about our conduct with others, with how we treat other people. Uh, it's really interesting when you study you know, prayer. And the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And in that prayer, what does he say? <laughs> Forgive. <laughs> it's how we relate to other people that is, has one of the biggest impacts on our prayer, and our life of prayer. Now, there's, I mentioned three times. I'll just, I'll just touch on them briefly here. You know, two of the times relate to righteousness and holiness. The first one uh, that we'll consider is in 1 Peter 3.12. He says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. Amen. <laughs> Let it be so. Lord, help me to walk in righteousness, because I want, I want your ears to be open when I cry out, because usually when I'm crying out, it's, I really need something. Lord, I need, I need you to hear me. I need an answer. Well, his, his ears are open to those who do right who walk in righteousness, but the face of the Lord is against those that do evil. So that's that, that direct correlation with our conduct. When we do right in God's sight, his ears are opened. But then in, in 1 Peter 4, 7, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And so, you know, a grow, growing and thriving prayer life in a connection with God uh, that endures to the end, it requires soberness. And, and really that, that's kind of relating to a life of holiness. Um, where, where if we're sober, we're, we separate ourselves from what would make us dull, right? Or, or senseless, um, it, when you think about that, right? You know, that when you think about being sober, it's obviously relating to, to drink, and that's drink just disconnects you. And so it says, be sober. Don't, you know, don't become dull, but walk, but separate yourself to walk. You know, when you, when you have a relationship some, with someone, you know, well, actually I'm jumping ahead here. 
And so that, that basically talks about living a holy life, right? Separating ourselves so that we can ha- maintain that living connection and so that we can endure. The end of all things is at hand. So we want to endure to the end. That requires holiness. But then the third and last one from Peter. Really, it's actually the first, but I, I saved it for the last. It's the first mentioned in his letter. 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, look out. This one's convicting for us. Likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as to the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And so here you have a situation that Peter's presenting of a husband not relating properly to his wife, not relating together according to grace. And, you know, when you have a relationship with someone and the oil of grace is not flowing, what's the result? I mean, you can just think about an engine or anything with metal that requires oil to deal with that friction. If you take the oil out, it just sparks fly and it grinds to a halt and seizes up. Right. And so if, and when that's in, in a relationship, if there's a relationship and the oil of grace is not flowing, the result is strife. Right. And so without divine grace, we're reliant upon our human ability. And, it, you know, if we lack patience and kindness and understanding, we don't cry out for the oil of grace. The result is going to be sparks and friction and heat. Things not very conducive to a relationship. You know, and of course, this is the, the specific example that Peter mentions is a husband. Uh, his prayers are hindered. Now, what a horrible thing that would that be? You know, Lord, I need to meet with you in this situation. I need to make a decision about this. And the response is silence. Why? Because of how he related to his wife. And of course, that's not limited to just husbands, right? I think, I, I think that it could very well be the reverse, you know, where maybe the spouse is not relating well to the husband and the oil of grace isn't flowing. Or it could be outside the marriage. It could be, you know, with children with parents or parents with children. <laughs> if they don't have grace to deal with bad attitudes and so forth. Or it could be how we relate to, to those in the body of Christ who are not yet perfected. Or maybe even how we relate to an unbeliever because we responded to them in a way that did not display who Christ is. But the reality is, is that God wants us to have a deep concern about our human connections because there will be a direct effect upon our connection with heaven. But if we will look to God, there is a wonderful, abundant oil of grace that he is ready to release as we seek to do what's right in his sight. Now, I want to come back to that thought of forgiveness, right? Of being cleansed and set free from the past and especially what people have done or said to us. You know, the harder part in a situation is usually not found for the one who commits the sin, right? If someone says something or does something unkind, and they realize that and they, they come to repentance. Usually they come to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me. And they might have to apologize to a few people. But, you know, they, they say sorry and come to the Lord. And, well, God meets with them. He, he cleanses their sin by, by the blood of Christ. And they're made clean. Of course, they have to find grace to not do it again. Or they have to keep repeating that. But the one it's done against, sometimes that hurt. It takes a lot more effort to overcome and 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 get clean from because it sometimes it can go down deep and you know those bitter feelings can be a, a painful battle to overcome. You know, there was a story I heard about a, a certain pastor and he was ministering with someone else and they were flowing together. But there came a time when when the pastor got married and it was almost like you know the other person saw the relationship and some jealousy formed of you know how how happy he was and and the heart of the one he was ministering against kind of turned against him and began to speak against him and kind of spread some bad rumors about him. And it was, 
it kind of got to the point where it's like they were seeking to destroy the reputation of this pastor. And for the pastor, it was actually very difficult. It was very painful. Um, the pain was, was real. It was like a betrayal because they had ministered and walked with this person. And they were describing it, and they just said it was such a long process of crying out to God, Lord, help me to overcome. Lord, help me to get victory over this, because they just felt such a deep betrayal in their heart. And, you know, it, this kind of went on for a while, crying out to God to be set free from these bitter feelings. And he said, the breakthrough started to come as one day he was just praying and the Lord spoke and said, I want you to pray for that person. And I want you to say, Lord, bless them more than me. Bless them more than me. But he, he wanted to get free. So he said, Lord, bless them more than me. You know, I, I want your blessing to come upon them because I, I want to get free from this. I want to get cleansed. I want to get the victory. And they just kept praying that over and over. And, and there was a change. There was a transformation that started to take place. Something broke. And healing began to, set, to take place. And they were set free. You know, and as we look to God... God wants to make provision for us to be set free from the past, to be set free from the pain of past situations, things done, things said, so that he can pour in the oil of grace upon us. Now, of course, as we, we previously, previously mentioned and we've shared several times in the past about the experience of Joseph and the Manasseh, you know, but I I feel this story is so powerful that it bears repeating. That Joseph experienced such betrayal by his those who should have loved him. And it should have scarred him for life. But somehow he was able to be set free from the pain of that. And he named his son Manasseh. God has caused me to forget. And of course, there's a story of, <clears throat> of a missionary and, and his wife who are ministering. And on the, on the mission field, there were some girls who visited and those girls, you know, desperately wanted to get married and they were kind of jealous of the, the wife of the missionary. And, and one day when the missionary was off doing things, you know, they said some very cruel things to the wife of the missionary, you know. And those things, even though we think, oh, sticks and stones, you know, you know can't hurt me, but they can and so the, those words went down deep. And even though the girls left and went off to do other things and, and this missionary's wife was just crying out, oh God, oh God, just cleanse me. And, but she was just having difficulty. And one day the Baileys came to visit and she just shared this with Sister Bailey. And Sister Bailey said, oh dear, you need a Manasseh. What's a Manasseh? It's God meeting with God so that he can cause you to forget the pain. And, you know, of course, she did that, and it, and it didn't happen right away, but she kept going. She kept coming to the Lord. Oh, God, give me a Manasseh. Until one day, she realized, I haven't prayed about that in a while. I've been set free. She remembered it in her mind, but the pain of that was totally gone, and God set her free. And so forgetfulness is really tied to the pain and the hurt of the memory of that experience. Maybe God will totally take it out of our mind. That's, that's even better. Mm -hmm. But if we don't, it doesn't matter. You know, this, this, this was now a testimony this lady could share of how God delivered her. And so God is so powerful. There's no limit to how he can cleanse us and set us free and give us victory if we yield to him. And, and you know, I believe God is here. He's in this sanctuary. He's here in this moment, you know, whether it's here in this place or watching online. And God wants to break the teeth of the young lion and bring deliverance. He wants to set his people free that Satan has no advantage over us, you know, because he wants to establish a clear connection between us and him, between us and heaven. 
You know, he wants to enable us to put things right in our connection with others. And so let's allow him to do that today by the oil of his grace. Amen.